Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. You can support this podcast on patreon.com forward slash first paw media. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by First Paw Coffee Company, specializing in private label premium blend coffee. If you're serious about coffee, you should check it out. First Paw Coffee's passion is high quality, small batch roasted coffee. They take the extra time to taste and get everything perfect before they release new blends. They aim to bring you a cup of happiness each time you pour yourself some coffee. Find out more at ak.dog slash free and enter for a chance to win some First Paw Coffee prizes, a book from our collection and tote bag. One winner will be selected at random each month. That's ak.dog slash free. Radio Free Palmer 89.5 KVRF presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. Hello and welcome to Mushing Radio. This is Robert Forto, and you can listen to us on KVRF 89.7 in the Matsu Valley. Radio Free Palmer dot org is our live streaming site you can hear all of our episodes over on dogworksradio.com be sure to check us out on social media by searching dogworks radio and today we have a very special interview my co-host alex stein sat down and spoke to virtually the ceo of iditarod rob erbach and here is the interview hi i'm alex stein i'm joined today by rob erbach who is the CEO of the Iditarod. And Rob, uh, thanks for making time and talking with us today. Sure, my pleasure. Great to be here, Alex. Um, So you started um, at Iditarod uh, in, I believe, the summer of 2019, and things seemed to be going along really very well. And then in the middle of your first race last year, the world sort of fell apart. Can you talk a little bit about um, what that was like to to go through Iditarod 2020 as uh, as COVID was shutting down things all over the place? Yeah, it, it became you know, Iditarod by itself every year. There are several dynamics that happen that probably couldn't be fully planned for with broad contingency planning. And that's usually things like storms or you know, changes, extreme changes in temperature, both hot and cold, water on the course, wildlife, moose issues, et cetera, but no one anticipated a pandemic. Now, we did have some insights because, you know, there were, the did a ride started last year, March 7, and, and there weren't cases in Alaska yet, but by the time we got midway through a race, the COVID was growing exponentially around the world and there were you know cases in alaska etc so we did some preliminary consistency planning in the event that there could have been a COVID on our trail the problem is that the trail if you know those your listeners are somewhat aware there's not a lot of uh there's not like there's local urgent care or hospitals or clinics out in the wilderness so it could have been a pretty difficult dynamic and especially early on when not knowing uh really the, that how um exasperating and how corrosive and contagious the virus was at that time. So we were uh, in a conversation with the state medical officers and even the governor. I had a couple tents back and forth with the governor asking us if we could stop our event as all other events were shutting down. I mean, the, uh, you know, basketball games, people were showing up, the players to the game and fans, and they would cancel them, you know, right around tip off. The NCAA tournament just canceled so it was a dramatic pullback across the world, and the villages in Alaska, interestingly, have a you know pretty difficult history with viruses. You know they were wiped out in 1918, and there's the famous 1925 case where diphtheria was threatening to um, all the lives of the children of Nome, and fortunately a dog sled team was able to deliver serum there. So there's a, there's a short history granted a, a while ago, uh, but there is just a notion that there is an inherent additional 
uh, lack of immunity in these native communities. As a result, they asked us to not to use their communities in the last half of the race, which is a bit of a challenge for us because the mushers are racing through, of course, they're generally pretty self-reliant, but we have a supply chain of dog care and veterinarians and logistic people and race judges that are at least used to having a cabin or a building to go into where there hopefully is heat and occasionally running water and electricity and internet, et cetera. And so we had to navigate around these villages and makeshift campsites, which was midway through, which was quite challenging. Um, at the same time, we had a, a bit of a scare where we had a Norwegian crew member come down with flu-like symptoms that we had to evacuate uh, with our own Air Force fly to um, Anchorage to immediately end by a healthcare worker at that point right to the hospital and tested while the whole crew had to quarantine. At that point in time, there weren't rapid tests, so it was three or four days. We got the results back, and we were very concerned that you know we had COVID on the trail. Fortunately, that was just a normal cold or flu and negative for COVID, so we managed to survive that, uh, and we had to sort of improvise on the fly. And what that looked like is, well, gee, the state's asking us if we can shut it down. So how do we shut down a dog race midway through when the course is already from front to back a couple hundred miles distance, and you don't necessarily nobody has a cell phone service out there. So to coordinate that, and really difficult to even evacuate dog teams halfway through the race. Then, of course, us being exasperating that problem because then we can no longer, you know, use the services that we normally use on village landing strips, et cetera. As the listeners may know, you know, Diderot is supported uh, almost all by the air uh, with our 30 plane air force and other uh, helicopters. And then certainly there are a handful of snow machines that we run uh, in support of that, but it's a heck of a difficult dynamic. So then the issue is, can we go in and know to finish and there we can sort of disassemble and unpack these dog teams, return, return dogs and teams to safety. And I can remember being in a tent um, meeting with the Nome uh, city council. You know, I, I, I showed up on a Nome. I think it was on a Sunday and on Monday we had these meetings on Tuesday, they shut down the city, you know, stop allowing people to come into the hotels, close the restaurants, et cetera. And I had all kinds of people that were planning on streaming in the Nome. It's a bit of a winter Mardi Gras and folks had flown in Anchorage and tour groups and we had to cancel that, which was a, a difficult thing. I'm sure happened on other travelers around the world that were, may have been boarding a cruise line and then couldn't go or had to come back into port shortly after boarding as a shutdown travel. So that was pretty dramatic. They asked us if we could finish without coming into Nome. And it's, it's not the easiest thing because you've got to be able to safely um, take get those dogs and take care of the dog teams as they come in. There's a whole protocol that we go through to ensure that the continuity of exemplary dog care. So we managed to um, talk through it with the known public health folks and medical personnel and the mayor and the regional governance structure there, uh, what our plan was, and our plan was to keep fans away. And to, at that point, this is when masks just starting to be coming uh, online. They weren't really wearing them yet. It was just you barely, at this point, you knew that you probably shouldn't be shaking hands. So as new news came through every day about what the proper protocols were, we tried to adapt uh, as well as we could. We didn't have any PPE or mask with us, but obviously if you're outside, you've got a, a gator on or something typically. So that was beneficial that, you know, we're, we're operating uh, in theater uh, in the Arctic region. So, you know, we know that there's not a lot of COVID transmission, hardly any at all that's proven uh, when you're masking outside. So that's sort of our, our natural set point. <laughs> um and so because of all those things, you know, we granted, you know, we have plenty of international media and international mushers there, but we uh, were able to, to navigate through that. And on top of that, Mother Nature came in and hit us pretty hard with some uh, epic storms that altered the, the race and, yeah, and frankly shut out numerous mushers from being able to finish last year. 
So on top of that, there were three Black Hawk rescuers and several that were brought in um, uh, by snow machine or just our planes where numerous mushers got caught in overflow, got caught in a storm. We had a group of 11 that tried to leave the, uh, the, the village of Elam twice and were battered down in storm, tried to retreat uh, to Elam. We had a group of volunteers stuck in White Mountain for six days. So we had all those things to manage. So it was, um, it was a lot. It was trial by fire. It was a, a heck of a, a crisis uh, to navigate through and, and something that, you know, that I'll hopefully be a, a better leader, you know, having to lead in a crisis like that as we're still uh, navigating through COVID now. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that as a fan, it was it was a really very very scary and ultimately really inspiring to see what a great job uh, you and the entire Iditarod crew did at handling this and getting people into Nome safely and then getting them out safely. And it's you know it's a big deal to get um, uh, fifty or sixty. Uh, uh, mushers and you know close to a thousand dogs um, out of Nome in in a an organized and timely manner when you when you don't have time pressure but when you have the extra time pressure that you faced it it really was kind of a remarkable thing to watch I I was wondering yeah. there was there was some um, speculation during the race that um, it, it might that there might have been a, a movement to hold uh, some of the mushers at Unalakleet to let the the first 20 go through to Nome, but then to hold the others at Unalakleet and to evacuate them from there. Was that something that was ever seriously considered? Discussed. You know, that was the only way we could evacuate was from Unalakleet because you can't really do it. You know us to do it because we couldn't get planes in and, and get dogs out in a, in a reasonable manner. So yeah, that that was discussed, and um, you know, seriously, I, you know, I, I don't think we were ever at the point where we were really close to to executing on that plan. But um, you know, we discussed everything, uh, and that would have been really the only opportunity to get teams out. So if you weren't, there was a discussion. If you weren't at least left uniquely by a certain point in time, your race would have been over, and we would have flown everybody out of there. Um, which could have been which could have been done, uh, but you know we we felt that. Um, I think also, you know, what really what was really helpful to us, frankly, is that we had that test waiting on that test result to come in. And granted, it was a media person who wasn't around mushers and was fairly isolated. But you know, even so, we're using community services and whatever food, et cetera, and you know, public facilities. So we, we are, and they're, they're sleeping on, you know, typically a, a floor of the of the community building. Right. And so we had some of that, and that would have been a it would have may, may have been a different decision uh, had that test been COVID positive, and we would have sorted out what the contact tracing process was. And you know, I'm not even sure if people were saying words like contact tracing early on, but um, you know, we were going trying to to to, to, to understand that and engineer every scenario as the trajectory of the virus. So getting that um, negative test result back was uh, uh, sort of it helped, certainly helped us to uh, get our, get our, everybody in the know. Yeah, uh, let me back up just for a sec. Um, you, you, come from a, you come from a very, very strong um, sports background and sports management uh, and uh, sporting league background, but you, you were relatively new to the world of um, dog sled races. And I'm wondering how it was for you to, to come in to an organization like Iditarod where, where you know, people who have been involved with the race for many, many years in the past have, have sort of been the ones running it. And I'm wondering how, what it was like for you to, to come in you know, as a relative outsider. Yeah, thanks. I think it was first, um, you know, to, to listen uh, as much as I can and, you know, learning every single day. So you're right. I knew very little uh, about the sport um, before I arrived. And fortunately, you do have a, a, a lot of experienced uh, team in terms of race production and management 
that have years and years of expertise. Um, but I think for me, it was just trying to, you know, learn the sport, uh, learn Alaska, learn all the partners and learn, you know, where I could add value, um, from my different perspective of being involved in other sports. You know, I have been responsible for bringing in some pretty significantly large events, you know, ran the world championship triathlons, um, uh, events. It's the Olympic program and ran the Olympic program. So certainly no stranger to sort of event risk mitigation and all the other elements that go with promotion and sponsorship around that. But yeah, I think the Ditterrad is a, is a totally unique beast. Um, you know, certainly uh, there are many, many things that, that make it unique, but obviously the most obvious one is, you know, right now we're running 14 dogs and maybe we'll go back to 16 at some point, but um, you got to be responsible for Musher and us for those well-being, and that's a you know a whole different dynamic in terms of you know I'm just going through today, for example, the COVID protocols for the chip reader. So every dog you know has their chip read before the start to make sure that dog has been through our EK our our, our preventative healthcare process and it's the right dog. <laughs> is there. And so it's, you know, the, just the, the care pre-race, uh, every dog gets a full on, you know, blood panel and EKG, uh, gets a test. They're doing those now. They'll get tested again, uh, a couple of days before, uh, on Wednesday before race on the weekend. So there's two big preliminary vet checks, all the labs are run and then a follow up and then, you know, they're, they're chipped and then all the other processes that we do and just learning, uh, about animal care, <laughs> you know, grew up with dogs. So, you know, it's a whole different level. Uh, uh, uh you know, the, the amount of wellness care they get is, is a, is a, is a lot more than I get. Right. So, um, learning that aspect of it, uh, and then, you know, learning that they're also the way good of experience of from running high performance programs is, you know, these dogs are like equivalent to Olympic athletes in terms of at least the top teams are very sophisticated in their, in their training methodologies and have all the same principles of, you know, base building and tapering and progressive training and, you know, rest nutrition and, you know, various um, uh, training loads that make these dogs so phenomenal athletes when they come to the start line. Now, there's some in the back that aren't as sophisticated to the really hobbyists that are just trying to get their belt buckle. And for them, it's just that spiritual journey. But for me, you know, been in the passion business my whole career for the most part in terms of the, uh, the, uh, sports and athletic side of things. So that wasn't a big, big leap. Um, and, you know, but again, still, you know, learning, um, all the nuances, uh, you know, there's a reason why rookies, uh, rarely do very well in this race. <laughs> Um, you know, certainly in the modern era, I don't, I'm not aware of a rookie. Uh, Thomas, who won last year, I think was 15th. Let me be wrong with that. His first year had a pretty good run. Last year, rookie of the year was 15. So that's sort of where the, the best rookie comes in. And there's a reason for that. There's so much learning, growing, the transformation that happens uh, on the trail. And I'm sure the top mushers you know, we'll study at the Dallas series of the world, but they're still learning. So there's something about the sport that's um, pretty mag pretty magnetic because there's so many forces at play. Some you can manage, some you can't. And then there's that mental fortitude piece of, you know, how do you deal with all the various adversities that are going to happen? So the unpredictability of it is different than, you know, this is obviously uh, outside in Alaska. You know, in triathlon, I always say that, sure, you know, it's a big day and an Ironman race is, you know, 2.4 ocean miles, 112 on a bike and a 26-mile marathon. But at the end of that day, you know, the athlete's going to get a massage, a nice meal, hotel bed, a shower, your staff's going to go home. Uh, <laughs> it's an all, it's a big one day uh, versus, you know, the average musher running, you know, 10 days and we're operating our our ecosystem 24 seven for, for 14 days at least. So it's a, it's a whole different beast. 
there's a lot of remarkable people who've been with the Iditarod for a long time. Um, Mark Nordman has been a, a really great um, uh, race manager, uh, race marshal. Um, but I always feel like one of the kind of undersung, maybe underappreciated by, by casual fans, uh, sort of heroes of Iditarod is Stu Nelson, who is the um, chief vet. And I, I make a point of watching um, uh, teams come in on the, on the Iditarod Insider, um, and even like way, way in the back, uh, every team that comes in, you can see Stu is like there in the background wearing his green coat. And every time someone comes in, you know, they, they talk to the press and they, um, you know, there, there's like a whole rigmarole that goes in, but you can see Stu is just like going up and down the line of dogs doing one last dog check making sure that everything is okay and you know to be doing that on top of all of the other stuff he does you know like supervising the voluntary vets and and being out on the trail and and you know taking tr care of the the vet checks beforehand it's kind of an astonishing thing and I, I feel like he doesn't get enough credit so I like to kind of call him out for credit when I can. Yeah, I'm sure I appreciate it. I'm sure uh, he will as well. And not only that, you know, so you know, some of them last years are coming in at three in the morning, some at 10 in the morning, some at three in the afternoon, he's going to be there. Right. So it's a, you know, it's a tireless. There's a lot of uh, uh, sleep deprivation that is managed, you know, on top of that. Um, and he's also obviously been traveling, you know, up the trail, uh, until that point. So it's, it's not as if, uh, we're getting a lot of rest and hanging out the four seasons along the trail too. So it's a, it's a, it's a big, it takes a lot of stamina and a lot of dedication. And I think that Stu, you know, it's like his, his calling, you know, his mission in life, uh, is the health and, and welfare, uh, of our dog community. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to the, the race this year. You have a, a very, um, detailed and I think uh, logical and sensible COVID protocol. I have to be honest, I, I before you announced this protocol, I really wasn't at all sure that it would be possible to, uh, to run the race this year. But this seems to me to be a very sensible way to let the race go forward. And um, so uh, first of all, I congratulate you on, and, and the entire team on developing this protocol. Uh, it's going to be a very different race this year, but um, uh, as you pointed out, there are always things that are changing. And um, I, I think it's going to be a very exciting race despite all of that. Yeah, thanks. You know, we are um, uh, doing this every day. So extensive conversations today with, as you mentioned, Stu, Mark, Dr. Jody Nelson. Um, now it's the point of uh, supply chain management. You know, we're, we're using, we're unfortunately in the testing business. We don't want to be, but we're, we're using four different kinds of tests. We have four different vendors and it's making sure our supply chain gets flown in the right place. And certain these tests have different uh, temperature ranges. So, you know, we're just sorting through all those all those challenges. It's just a, a long, long list has kept us going uh, every single day. You know, we uh, uh, working all, all every every weekend and for for months. So we're we're feeling pretty good about where we're at. Um, we still may have some challenges that we haven't anticipated. The the you really understand the complexity of what because we need to know when someone travels, if you're a race judge, a vet, um, a, a drug tester, you know, where are you going to be, when, how, and how are you, it's going to get tested. And there's little things like results management. So without, it's not that interesting as to talk about, but I just thank you. Cause it, it's been, um, it's been a lot to tackle and to digest. And we think uh, we can have a race with zero COVID prevention is certainly our goal. There's no guarantee um, but we're just doing everything we can and pressure testing it with uh, local health care officials, infectious disease officials, epidemiologists, virologists. So we feel really good. It's 
pretty robust. There may be even some redundancies. And, you know, we, we have a pretty strong building out a, I'll call a self-reinforcing culture so that we're all distancing and, and masking as appropriate. We had the benefit of most of the action uh, happening outside. So uh, we have a natural barrier to that as well. But it's still a heck of a challenge. Unfortunately, we did have to cancel our ceremonial start. There was no way we could um, keep the crowd away for that. But it's not going to impact the integrity of the race. Uh, we do, we're pretty excited about the course. From an insider coverage perspective, it's actually a bit easier for us to cover this year. So one of the challenges we have is getting sort of the back of the pack, especially years like last year where we got – what happened last year, a couple things happened. One, storms happened. Two, uh, a bunch of the insider crew who work with Greg Heister are from Washington State, and Washington State was uh, first hit with a big – you know, Seattle. And there was a rumor that they were going to close the border, and some of those folks were worried about – getting back to their families, and at that point, it was very scary as the outbreak happened near Seattle, and people were getting really sick very fast. So we had to send a couple, we lost a couple of folks who needed to get back to their families, and then we got walled by storms, and we couldn't get camera, couldn't fly to get the back of the pack. But this year, because the fact they're coming back into, towards town, you know, not, you know, an hour, half or so from Anchorage, in the willow, it should be a lot easier for us to capture. Um, you know, they're still off the road system, but there's a pretty good trail network up there. So <clears throat> we land at willow right where the finish is, uh, but we also can take our snow machine crew out there and, and get a lot more footage potentially we've ever had. So from that standpoint, it should be pretty interesting. And then of course the rushers coming back over the other way on, on the Alaska range, which will be pretty challenging. We'll see how that you know, we, what happens there. And then I think also just the fact that we're sort of honoring, uh, you know, Alaska, you know, was certainly, you know, had a native community, but then was settled uh, through gold rush. So in 1908, gold was discovered uh, in Flat, which is near Ditterod. And then at one point there were 10,000 people living out that way. And those early pioneers, you know, were traveling uh, by dog sled teams. They had the water in the summer, but, uh, you know, most of the time they're, they're, they're traveling around and, and transport and life was enabled because of those dog sled teams. So we're, you know, pioneering the trails uh, to honor that culture as well. So it's, you know, we, you know, it's the 49th edition of the Iditarod, the 49th state. So we feel like it's going to be a pretty good viewing experience from our insider channel. And, and uh, just so, sort of a, uh, you know, we just don't know with uh, coming back over the range. That's where the weather can get pretty, usually pretty crazy, and so that there's some crazy things could happen there too. Right, uh, you know, it's it's totally understandable, but also sad that um, the ceremonial start is is going to be canceled, and and some of the other pre-race events like the um, the banquet. Um, I'm wondering, and I don't want you to reveal any state secrets or anything, but is is that is that like a big financial hit that the the race is going to take? Because I know the banquet brings in a lot of money, and and the uh, and the idea to rider program for the ceremonial start also brings in a run, yeah. lot of money. Yeah, we do a lot of merchandise sales. No, it hits things for sure. Yeah, uh, we'll be okay. You know, we're we're uh, going to do a virtual banquet, which will be free everybody, but we will be having. You know, our auction items, um, and uh, we hope to drive more insider subscribers uh, this year than ever before. Um, we have a pretty exciting raffle out there. But, yeah, no, it's, it's no doubt. No, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, you know, it's not an existential threat, but it definitely stings. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, like a lot of sports, um you know, there, there's there's some support out there, but not it's nothing like having the, the real thing. The uh, you know we do sell you know 1,504 tickets last year, 100 bucks for the banquet. So you can do the math on that. Yep. We do a, a couple hundred. We do a lot of merchandise uh, at the ceremonial and at the lakefront, and even our headquarters. We're not going to have a tourist here this year. Um, yeah, so it's, it, unfortunately for Alaska, it's, it's a pretty challenging environment, and we're certainly hit by it. But, 
you know, it's not going to, um, we face some probably bigger issues than that. So one time, you know, if, if COVID is involving us in 22, I think the world's got worse problems, but, um, you know, we, we just need to get ourselves through this race and gear up for our 50th year anniversary next year. I, I think that is going to be an epic party. And, uh, I yeah, know a lot of right. people who can't, who, you know, are discouraged or can't come, uh, this year and certainly shouldn't come this year are planning on coming next year. And I know that you have, um, uh, you have this race to get through, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, on the future of mushing given, given, you know, challenges facing, uh, the sport like climate change, um, just the, the insane economics of, of running a dog team or running a race like Iditarod. And I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts, uh, about the future. Yeah, you know, I want to look, I mean, there's, there's a possibility we might want to start the race earlier in the future. You know, you, you know, if you, um, would give us, you know, if it's, uh, it's starting to get pretty warm, uh, in, uh, in March, in Alaska over the last 10 years, and you can look at the temperature differential a couple weeks earlier, that's one opportunity. Now we'd want to do that in concert with the other events because you know, there's the K 300 that's going off now and, you know, other events that around the world and Bear Greece and events in Norway, because we'd, we want to maybe look at the calendar. Um, so that's one way that we could think about climate change if needed. Not sure we're going to need it. You know, last year, pretty good snow this year. The last year was crazy snow. So, you know, it's climate change kind of goes in all different directions. Right. But, um, Obviously, there's a couple of years I just started at Fairbanks, and so we wouldn't want to. That's a, a bit of a, a bit of a bit of automatic. So, um, but there's option to go earlier. It would, might solve a lot of that a lot of that problem. Uh, in terms of sport, look, I think the, here's the crazy thing about the sport. It's such a great anecdote to you know the proliferation of the thumb generation esports. We're the opposite of that. And yet, we need to be more relevant to younger generations of fans. And we're doing that through, we think it, our coverage is getting better. We have opportunities to gamify with various fantasy sports applications that we're going to be building out. Um, we are launching a broader programming instead of just people going on to our channel and paying attention to us for a couple weeks in March. We have uh, started to populate a lot of content that be interesting to anybody that was had a dog or likes dogs or wanted to learn how to take care of the dog better. So we really think we have the ability to be a thought leader in terms of training and nutrition and genetics and, and breeding and general wellness care because we've done a lot of research. We have a fairly robust uh, veterinary program and to disseminate that information out there will make us more relevant because, you know, I mean, dogs are, you know, not just during COVID, but, you know, continue to, to have a pretty good growth. Uh, dog, the dog world is a, you know, $50, $60 billion business. And there's a lot of people that would be interested in what we have to say and have to offer outside of just sled dogs. Also, you know, we, we want to do a better job really at promoting uh, ski during and bike during, meaning, you know, dogs in the harness, you know, maybe one or two dogs that people run with and ski with and, and bike with. Uh, it's just a great, you know, dogs love it, people love it. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous win all the way around. And, you know, there are the companies that, 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 that we engage with that are in that space. A lot of our mushers are doing more and more of that uh, during the summer and the off-season, are uh, training with their dogs on trail um, with, you know, two dogs on a mountain bike. Or for those mushers that are good runners, they can run with their dogs and, and get some training in that way. Excellent. Thank you so much for taking the time um, to talk to me today. And I, you know, I am always hopeful that the race will be will be fun and safe. And um, I know there are a lot of challenges. And I just really want you to know that we we in the fan community really appreciate all all that you guys do. And I think sometimes there are there are fans who are a little bit too much on the complainy side. So uh, I want to make sure that you know that we really do uh, appreciate everything that that you do and that the organization does. Yeah, thanks, Alex. You know, we're, we're certainly uh, not perfect, but we're, we're doing the best we can. And, you know, I'm happy to 
you know, uh, if, if there's a if there's a constructive criticisms or complaints from the fan base, I'm, I'm happy to hear it. We're open to doing things. There's there's um, uh, so many challenges that happen behind the scenes that I think people probably don't always realize, and with our insider coverage and how hard it is to get the signal uh, out there and off and get planes around, and you know sometimes they can't land a plane in a certain spot because they put a ski down in the snow, it's too soft, and the pilot's got to pull out of that landing. So that stuff happens every year. And, um, you know, we're doing the best we can. We think we've got a really great culture, a great event, and I'm getting excited. We're 21 days out and counting down. Yeah, and I I am so looking forward to – I know there's there's like a whole race to get through before probably you start thinking a lot about this, but I am so looking forward to I Did a Rod 50 – and um, and I think that there's going to be just an explosion of fans who who want to come back to the race next year. Yeah, thank you. You know, we unfortunately all the tour groups and all the lodges up along the trail, like Rainy Pass and Roan, have all you know been canceled in the grass. But I think everyone said we're coming next year. So you want to come next year? If you you know, if you went down the trail, it's, you can make plans pretty quickly because it seems like we're going to have this just floodgates of people that couldn't come this year. And because it's our 50th, and I think we're going to have a pretty massive celebrations uh, in both Anchorage, and we have some ideas to truly make Nome uh, even bigger than it is and, and even more festive and fun and honoring uh, all the culture. So, you know, um, you know, it's everything from, um, you know, next year, every mushers. They get the belt buckle if they finish, but they're also going to get a, a medallion that represents the uh, original uh, 1925 mushers in the gnome. And there's just a number of things that we're going to be rolling out in, in terms of in the honoring and celebrating for our 50th year. So we're, we were putting out a new logo and doing a whole refresh of the brand. We've got some really cool merchandise that we're planning for our 50th year. So I'm ex- I'm really excited. We've got to get through this race, but. It'll be, I'll be starting on that as soon as we get everybody into uh, back into Willow at the finish. Great. Uh, I, I can't wait. Thank you again so much. All right. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by First Paw Coffee Company. Learn more at firstpaw.coffee. From Dog Works Radio, this is Mushing Radio. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you'll see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe, too. Your hosts are Alex Stein and Robert Forto. Our producer is Robert Forto, created for Dog Works Radio.